first sort of, um, aside from the data that you already gave um, when setting up the company, your domain name is really one of the first items of property that the company or the business has. It's, it's actually valuable um, property. Yeah, so like for our business, FMC dot, um, I won't say what dot it is, <laughs> but FMC dot is, is, is essentially our property. Yeah, we have a logo. Um, that's another thing that you as a business will be doing, getting a logo um, for your business. Again, that is another aspect of property. Following on from that, you obviously want to, you know, create a digital footprint for yourself on, you know, all the social medias. There's somebody who mentioned Facebook, one of my colleagues over there, Diana, she was saying Facebook is old. Um, everyone now is on TikTok, everyone now is on, on um, Instagram, X. So, I mean, it's interesting how you have all these options to actually expand your digital footprint. And let's not forget our emails, um, our websites, so all these are areas where um, data is playing a role in enabling um, your business to, to grow and expand. Coming now to the topic, um, this data that you have, the, the logos, you have the, um, the domain name, you have all your pro property, you know, you may have some product out there, you may have some process that you want to protect you now start thinking about things like intellectual property. How do I protect my information? You also start thinking about things like data privacy. Why do we think about data privacy? Because remember, initially when we set up our company, what kind of information are we giving to the government? Personal. I'm giving my name, I'm giving my ID, I'm giving my personal information. So number one, we have to think about personal data, which is data of all of us essentially um, individual, individual data. And we also have to think about commercial data. So commercial data, this is now your business data, your logos, your processes, your confidential information. And all this is very important for you to understand because as you start doing business, you're going to start connecting with other people. I hope we're on the second slide. <laughs> You're going to start con um, communicating or contracting, let's say contracting and connecting with third parties. You're going to be doing business with not just your customers, you're going to be doing business with your suppliers. Um, you're going to be collecting information, you're going to be hiring um, employees. Imagine how much data you're now collecting two years down the line. As a law firm, I mean, I, I cannot even imagine, even now, I can't even start thinking how much data we collect on a day-to-day -day basis. I can also not imagine how much data we process, say, to do an agreement, to do a transaction. Some of this data has to go to third parties, for example, other law firms or other clients or other you know, parties who are, we're dealing with. Cross-border transactions with data protection, it's become a key consideration. Um, Data is not just flowing locally, it is flowing internationally. As we said, we're all operating in digital markets. Some of our customers, I think somebody mentioned one of their customers was based in Texas. Um, so a lot of our business is actually um, cross-border, uh, dealing with related parties, dealing with business partners, consumers, and all these um, present questions to us. When it comes to commercial data, some of the questions we should be asking ourselves, what data do you own that you feel is valuable? I mean, for me personally, um, my, lo my logo is very, very valuable. It's, it's, a, it's a brand that you have built over several years, a decade of, of legal practice. It's a valuable, valuable brand. So that is something that I feel that is, is valuable. What is the risk in sharing your information and putting yourself out there. We mentioned this aspect of digital footprint, setting yourself up, um, sharing your content online. Um, you know, we are all on, on, on social media. That content is also being reshared by other parties. 
who you may not know. Um, so again, there's that risk of content and, and, and information being shared. And this is your commercial data. Another key aspect to consider what is con confidential and what is safe for public con consumption. So you may have trade secrets that you, that you have within your organization. Of course, those are information that you may not want to publicly share. But maybe you're handling a transaction whereby you're doing a merger, yeah? Or um, an acquisition, and the other party needs to have access to such data. So of course, at certain points within your business, you may have to share certain confidential information. Again, what are safeguards and remedies that are there to reduce and eliminate the risks of misuse of any confidential information that you share out? Um, and I think we'll, we'll mention a few of the safeguards that are there for commercial data. When it comes to personal data, what personal data are we sharing with you know, our friends, our business partners? Have we got consent? Today, or most of us, I think, had to put a sticker on our, on our cards, on our name cards, which is fantastic. I mean, I haven't seen this from any other organization. Uh, so this is kudos to Kenick for, for really looking out for data privacy of, of everyone over here. What safeguards does your business have in place for, you know, if data is misused or lost? And finally, how do we protect us, ourselves against claims of misuse? Recently, um, if you guys have been following um, what the regulator, the Office of the Data Prote Protection Commissioner, ODPC, has been doing, there have been a lot of cases coming out where there are cases where, you know, data privacy issues are so widespread, uh, so prevalent in our economy, a lot of people don't understand why or how to, you know, manage any data that they receive, data not just of clients, data of even people within your organization. And I think these are very, very important discussions to have. I think I'll go to that slide. Um, so risks. As lawyers, risks is where we really, you know, uh, handle our bread and butter when we're dealing with client issues. Um, businesses, of course, have risks when it comes to, um, you know, data, use of data. For example, um, as we mentioned earlier, we were talking about real estate business. Real estate businesses are probably one of the most effective businesses when it comes to digital markets. They're very proactive there. I think some of us, if we're on social media and we click on a link to a real estate developer, automatically you probably get a call or some marketing information is, is sent to you. However, the, the business itself collects a lot of data not just from investors, from consumers. So there are those challenges that need to be considered. What happens with that data when they receive it? Where does it go? Who is, has access to the data? As lawyers, if we're representing a real estate company, we're obviously gonna receive that data. How do we protect that data to ensure that it is not misused or mishandled? When it comes to confidential information and trade secrets, the risk, of course, is that in, you know, your competitors can get some competitive advantage if you have access to your information. So again, all these are things that you need to consider when it comes to, um, to risk. Logos, trading names, we've had some recent experiences whereby uh, clients have had, you know, they've been checking online um, and they realize that somebody else is using their logo, trying to pass themselves off as the same business. We've seen a lot of that happening, especially it happens in my view when businesses start to scale up a bit. So say for example, after two to three years, you'll find people are now monitoring your activity much more closely um, and it becomes more imperative for you as a business to really consider these issues um, and how to protect and monitor such activity. Um, somebody mentioned um, cyber, crim cyber, cyber criminal activity, um, I think in the last session. Um, so websites, servers, these are all at risks. Um, I think I had a discussion about a year ago with one of our IT consultants. He was telling me our webs, our internet um, server was under constant threat of attack, constantly. Somebody is trying to constantly hack us. Yeah, so it's, it's not as if we are just sitting and waiting for an attack. The attacks are actually constantly happening. 
Um, and finally, domain, domains. I think we, we had this discussion earlier. I think some, someone mentioned, I think it was Viona. Um, cyber squatters are rampant. Again, we've had these cases. Dealing with them is very difficult. You have registered a domain with .ke. Uh, you may not have registered with .com. Somebody else goes and registered with .com. You're now fighting with that person for your own domain. I think um, when it comes to the registrars, something you can consider is to actually do a bit of due diligence when somebody asks to register with you. Because uh, of course there's a business reason for you accepting a registration if the name is available. However, some of these brands have built their reputation over a long period of time. So maybe some due diligence, just check up. Has, has, has a name been registered with another registrar? If it has, maybe consider not <laughs> not registering that with that that same same name with your with your business and finally before i hand over to Anne, um there are challenges with enforcement of intellectual property in particular uh, rights uh, there's complexities sometimes you may have people who have registered interests ahead of you even though perhaps you have used um, that property or that name for a longer period so sometimes when you use a particular phrase or a particular name or a particular prop, um, intellectual, uh, let me say a particular trademark for some time, don't take too long before you register it. If you feel it's a valuable name, a unique name, go ahead and register it. Protect yourself because at the end of the day, if somebody protects it before you, you're going to spend a lot of time and money trying to have that trademark expunged. Costs, of course, you know, lawyers have to be paid. Um, costs of filing have to be paid. It's expensive when you are, you, you, you know, trying to enforce um, intellectual property rights. Time, uh, these cases don't happen and uh, or don't get completed quickly. And of course, some of these offenders are not easily traceable. So again, this goes back to the data that maybe the registrars are collecting in terms of how you register entities, what data are you collecting? Because I think there's one case whereby the only information when we did a search was just one name, a name. We couldn't find any more information. Either it was not being made available or um, they had not um, given that information. So some of them are difficult to trace. Some of them are also in different, different jurisdictions. So imagine you trying to enforce your trademark in Kenya against somebody who's based in the US. Um, I mean, it becomes a, a minefield. Key takeaway, it's important to safeguard, protect, and defend your business against data breaches and against misuse of confidential or commercial data. What can businesses do to ensure that data you collect, that you collect or own is protected? And maybe you can tell us. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Anne, like you've heard, and since I'm the one holding you from going to lunch, for lunch, I'll try as much as I can to maybe finish in the next five minutes, or maybe two, who knows. So, I think the panel, the first panel, they talked about websites and schools. You know, I was quite shocked to see that there are so many schools that have websites. Back in my day, a millennial here, there were not so many, like I thought my school had a website. So you see now with the introduction of many schools having websites, uh, there's something, uh, and uh, there are so many schools are collecting so much data from, you know, the students, the parents, uh, some donors maybe. Uh, there's been the introduction of, you know, the Data Protection Act, and through that they've introduced something called registration if you, uh, so by registration, are you registered as a data processor? Are you uh, registered as a data controller? So let's say an example of a school. 
which collects so much data of the people in the school, they should be registered as a data controller since they collect so much data and they decide so, uh, this data that we've collected, what do we need this data for? Do they tell the students and also the, especially the parents because they collect data of you know minors, do they tell the school that we are collecting this data for ABCD maybe to help us um, I've had swimming is now a, a, a lesson. Maybe they collect the data to learn. So student A and B and C have gone for swimming classes and ETC. So, and also when it comes to data processors, these are people who you, you as a, let's say the school, who you contact to help you maybe um, pay payroll something of the sort, because as an organization, you can't do everything for yourself. Okay, some can, not but some you need to outsource out there. So the people that you use as your data processors, are they registered? And the good thing right now with um, data processors and controllers is that you as an organization, before you uh, contract to a person who has a data processor, at least you can go to the website of the data um, what is it called, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner and check if the person that you want to engage in as a data processor, are they registered? So that they can, this can help you at least um, know that the information that you're going to give out to the data processor is going to be safe and that they're not going to misuse your data in any way. So another thing would be, I've talked about registration, documentation, we as lawyers, we thrive so much on documentation. When a client comes and they give us an uh, issue, we ask them, okay, so what documents do you have? Uh, so you have an issue with your employee. Did you have an employment contract? No. So if not, these are uh, consequences. The same thing when it comes to collecting data and also maybe assigning or outsourcing, inform outsourcing another party to help you with data collection. Do you have a document such as a data processing agreement which will help you um, come up to you and your data processor? They will need to know, okay, so I've been given this job to collect data on, on behalf of my client for purposes of payroll. So what do I need to use this information for? This is what I can use it for, this is what I can't use it for. Can I transfer this information to a third party? So with a document like a data processing agreement, it will help guide companies when it comes to how they run their internal affairs in the organization. Then also, Fidel has spoken, has spoken about um, NDAs. You know, sometimes you might need to source another company to help you. Maybe you are a company that makes uh, handbags. And since you can't do it on yourself and you need a person who can help you create that bag, you might need to sign a document like an NDA telling them, so this is the bag I want to create and this is a design, but before we go forward, please sign this NDA because I don't want my information out there. I don't want this design to be copied. So these are some of the documentations that you as an organization can think about when you discussing data protection, also trying to um, find uh, loopholes in your organization. Then, uh, I sorry, I can't see. Okay, uh, self sorry, no, it's the last one, the self-regulation and risk management. So you as an organization, as much as you are trying to grow your business, you know you can't grow your business without you checking inwards and realizing, okay, so we have this organization. Do we have the right documentation? You know, so I have employees. Do I have an employment contract? Do, under my employment contract, is there a clause on data protection? And I'll give an example when it comes to employees you have maybe a website and the photos that you've used are your employees. So does this mean just because I was employed in company A and I've left company A and moved to company B, does that mean since I had signed an employment contract, then that means that you can use my photo until 
maybe you get bored even if I left the company after so many years. You know, so these are some of the things that as a company you need to think about when it comes to data protection because because uh, it opens up a new thing of consent. Like you see, we before the Kenny can post our pictures, we have given them the consent. This is the same thing when it comes to employees. Have your employee given you the consent to post their picture on your website until they've even if they've left the organization, you can still use your, the photo. So these are some of the uh, conversations that and uh, establishments need to be thinking about. And also, let's say you have a website. Under your website, when people log in, what's the, uh, do you have a data privacy policy? Do you have a cookie policy? Do you have terms of uh, use under your website? These are some of the conversations that now people are starting to think about when they have a website. And lastly, uh, you as an organization, are you conducting trainings for your employees? Because at the end of the day, as much as you need your clients, your clients cannot op uh, get the benefit of your organization without you having employees. So does, do your employees know that once they receive information about your clients, they're not supposed to be you know, going out and say, oh, you know, this person is a celeb and they're our client, they bought this unit under this development, Yesterday I met this client, this is their phone number. Do your uh, employees know that at the end of the day, you're supposed to keep confidential information in the office, trade secrets in the office? These are some of also some of the things as an employer you need to think about. And I uh, think lastly, I'll talk about intellectual property. And I think Fidel has already like spoken about a lot about intellectual property uh, when it comes to registration. You know, as much as you have like a um, domain name, having a domain domain name is having a domain name does that doesn't end there. You can also go to the extent of registering your trademark with um, Kipi, because at the end of the day, we've seen so many people using other trademarks to register um, domain, main, domain name just because they want to benefit from the goodwill of this well-known company. So it's good as much as you register your domain name, also think about registering your trademark. Also another thing is some organizations, we've seen that they have some names that are quite unique to them. Uh, let's say like um, Safaricom, I think that is Safaricom the better option. So whenever you hear that phrase, you think about Safaricom. So it's good if you're an organization and you have this unique phrase that is known to you, it's good for you to also think about registering it with uh, the office of uh, keeping. And also another thing would be, so in this era we share so many information in the digital space. So when it comes to sharing your information, how can you protect yourself? Because I think there was a, um, uh, a speaker who spoke about advising entrepreneurs to register, because you know if you register, this gives you the willpower and the strength to protect yourself, like you know your rights, and at least you have the power to enforce your rights, because at the end of the day, everyone knows that uh, this uh, trademark is registered under me, and so if anyone was to use this trademark, then I know that I can go to uh, the court, or maybe at least I have the strength to go and fight for my right, because I have registered my trademark. So when it comes to online sharing of information, how as an uh, as a organization you can safeguard your right is first, let's say through, if your organization is uh, you, um, used to taking pictures, a way that you can protect yourself is your picture having like a watermark. This is one of the way that at least if a person wants to use your picture of, maybe you've taken a picture of the Masai Mara and someone wants to use it to advertise their company. At least someone would know this picture came from person A and that it's not the original work. Another thing would be if you're sending information from one company to another, it's very nice to restrict the users that you're going to use to send the information to. 
and I remember there was a time my colleague used to send emails to one particular client and she would copy like all of us in the office. But when this client returns the email, he removes everyone in copy. Then she would return the email again with everyone in copy. So it was a back and forth until one day the client told her, okay, there's a reason why I'm removing all these people and in the email is because I don't want my information to be out there with everyone knowing it. So that can be also another way. Uh, another way can be, I've seen people who when they send us information, they put passwords on their documents. There's another way that if you want to send information, have password protected documentation. And uh, also lastly, be mindful of who you send your information to. Don't send your information to a source that you do not trust. And I think my presentation is over. And so 